Hey, in this video I'd like to give you an introduction into reverse engineering a bare metal ARM microcontroller firmware using Ghidra and a script called SVD Loader. Now before we start, let's quickly talk about what bare metal is. On a computer or on a smartphone, an application runs on top of an operating system. This operating system will then use drivers to communicate with the actual hardware. In the case of a bare metal system, our application runs directly on the hardware without any operating system or so in between. In the wild, you will find that a lot of smaller embedded and IoT devices will be bare metal systems, such as for example the Amazon Dash buttons, smart light bulbs, electric door locks and so on. In this video, we will look at a firmware running on top of an ARM Cortex-M microcontroller. More specifically, we will look at something that runs on an ST Microelectronics STM32, which is a widely used ARM-based microcontroller family. The microcontroller has a lot of integrated peripherals, such as general purpose input outputs, UART, I2C, SPI and so on. The specific controller I'll use today is the STM32F446RE and on the STM Microelectronics website you can get a nice overview of all the features it contains, such as 4x I2C, a camera interface, HDMI and so on. In the datasheet of the microcontroller you can find the pinout, which depends on the specific package you use, but basically the programmable inputs and outputs are organized in ports. Here I've highlighted port A consisting of 16 GPIOs. GPIOs, or general purpose input outputs, can be used to connect all kinds of stuff such as LEDs, switches and more complex things such as displays and so on. The hardware support for I2C and so on can be mapped to certain pins by configuring the chip peripherals. Now, without an operating system that provides us with syscalls and drivers, how do we actually talk to all of these features? This is done using something called memory map peripherals or memory mapped I.O. Cortex-M processors have a flat memory map without any memory management unit or so, and our flash, our RAM, and all of the peripherals will be available by accessing their respective memory addresses. For example, on the STM32, the flash, which also contains our code, will be mapped at hex 0800, the RAM at hex 2000, and all the peripherals start at hex 4000. To configure these peripherals, all we have to do is write the right data to the right addresses in memory. An overview over the memory map can be found in the datasheet of the processor. If we zoom into the lower part, we can see our flash starting at hex 0800, the integrated RAM at hex 2000, and also a big block for peripherals. This block is extended on the right and indicates the address ranges for peripherals on different in-chip buses, such as AHB1 and 2 and APB1 and 2. We don't care about these buses specifically, we do however care about what's on them. A few pages down in the datasheet we can see that on AHB1 all the GPIOs are mapped and that for example the port A we saw earlier starts at hex 4002. But what does this actually mean? It means that all the registers that we need to configure the input output port are mapped to that specific address and if we go into the reference manual to this section about GPIOs we can see that there's a full section on all the different registers that are available to configure a GPIO. The first register is called the GPIO port mode register or GPIO mode R which is mapped at offset 0. Combining the address for GPIO A we just got from the datasheet with the offset tells us that the GPIO A mode R register will be at address hex 4002. We can also see the bit fields for the register. In this case we have two bits for each of the 16 pins filling the full 32 bit register. The values for these two bits are listed below 00, 0 to configure the pin as an input 0, 1 to configure it as an output, 1, 0 for alternative function mode, which is the mode required to use I2C and SPI and so on, and 11 for analog mode. Now let's say we want to configure pin A0 as an output. All we have to do is to set the first bit of the register, for example, by just writing 1 to the address hex 4002. Now to enable the output, for example, to turn on an LED, we need to look at the GPIO port output data register or GPIO ODR. In this register we have a single bit for each pin. We can also see that the offset for the peripheral is hex 14, so we can access the output data register for port A at address 4002 and 14. Let's say we want to turn on pins 0 and 1. All we have to do is to set bits 0 and 1 in the register, for example by writing 3 to the register address. I've set up a Nucleo F446 dev board with a firmware that simply blinks an LED. Let's load that firmware into Ghidra and see how exactly it works and how we can reverse engineer it. I've exported my firmware to a binary file, you can find it in the description if you want to follow along. 
I simply drag it into an empty Ghidra project and you will see that Ghidra detected the format as raw binary, which means that it's not able to detect information about the file such as the architecture and so on. We have to fill these details in ourselves. Let's start with the language. We know this is a Cortex-M processor, so we can simply search for Cortex and get two hits, Little Endian and Big Endian. In most cases, Cortex-M will be Little Endian. I'll show you some tricks on how to detect that in a future video. Next, we also have to configure some options. On the STM32, code normally starts executing from flash, and the flash is located at address hex 0800. So we have to tell Ghidra to load our file to that address. Let's hit OK and double click the file to start the code browser. Before we can analyze the file, let's finish configuring our memory map. If you check the datasheet, you will find something interesting. Address 0 will be alias to flash, SRAM or system memory depending on some factors. In the wild, it will almost always be mapped to flash. You can check the STM application notes on the details of this. Having our flash alias to address 0 means that our flash will be in memory twice, once at hex 0800 and once at 0. To tell this to Ghidra, we need to create a new memory block. Let's call it flash mirror. Leave the start address at 0 and use the same length as our main flash. We also need to make sure we set this flash to executable so Ghidra knows that it may contain code and we want to initialize the memory block with the contents of our file. We also want to create a second memory region for our RAM, which starts at hex 2000. This will help us avoid having invalid references. Feel free to try this on your own machine. You will see that setting up the memory map correctly can drastically help you improve the decompilation results. Once that is all done, we can start the analysis. One great feature for unstructured firmware is the ARM Aggressive Instruction Finder, which will allow you to find code even if no direct references to it could be found. After analysis is finished, let's jump to address 0 and start reversing. You can see that Ghidra marked a couple of things here, such as the master stack pointer, reset, NMI, and so on. This is called the vector table. On boot, the CPU loads the stack pointer from here and puts it into the stack pointer register. And you can see that the stack pointer indeed points into our RAM region. And then it jumps to wherever the reset vector points. The NMI, hard fault, and so on vectors are the addresses of interrupt handlers. For example, if you do an invalid memory access, the CPU will jump into the hard fault handler. Let's start the same way the CPU would, by jumping to the reset vector. In most cases, the reset vector contains some simple setup code, similar to what you would see in the entry part of a C program, before then jumping into the actual main function. The same is true here. We can see some loops that are used to set up some things we don't yet care about, and then a function call. This will be our main function. Let's jump into that function. The first thing that the eye jumps to is something read in the listing view, a pointer that points to hex 4002 and hex 4002 and 14. That's where GPIOA is at. But let's not get ahead of ourselves and instead go into the first function, which simply calls another function three times with different parameters. Going into that function, we see again a strange address that sounds like some peripheral address. But going back to the reference manual each time and checking what a specific address is gets old really quickly and can burn a lot of time. Which is why I built a simple script for Ghidra called SVD Loader. SVD Loader uses SVD or System View Description files. SVD is a standardized format to describe the peripherals of Cortex-M processors, so they contain all the register addresses and so on. They are normally used by development and debugging tools, but in our case also contain all the information we need to make reverse engineering of bare metal firmware much easier. You can find SVD Loader linked in the description, and also links to collections of SVD files for all kinds of processors. Personally, I currently have over 800 SVDs on my machine. I'm just going to double click the script and select the SVD file for the STM32F446 and hit OK. After a couple of seconds, SVD Loader will be finished. If we take a look at the memory map now, we can see that SVD Loader generated a lot of new memory blocks for the different peripherals. And in the namespaces, there is now a peripheral entry containing all the different peripherals that were loaded. And the ones that are actually used in the code are marked in blue. Going back to our decompilation window, we can see that the strange offset turned into rcc.cr. So this function does something with the reset and clock control registers, which are used to turn on and off certain peripherals and clocks. Let's just call this rcc something and the parent function rcc setup and go back to our suspected main function. Here we can see that our previously red reference is now blue and points to peripherals GPIO A. If we double click the pointer in the decompilation, we can simply convert the undefined data to be a pointer and Ghidra will give it a nice name based on what it points to. 
Let's also set the type of the pointer to UIN32. As we know, it's writing to a 32-bit register. We can also see some other constants being used in a loop. Let's double-click it and convert it to an integer, and we can see that we just have two loops that count to 1 million. Let's start walking through the code. We skip the RCC setup and then see that the GPIO A mode R register is being configured. As we saw earlier, each pin has two bits in this register. So let's show it as binary and start counting bits. And we can see that this sets pin 5 as an output. Next, we see a write to the GPIO A output data register. Let's also convert it to binary and we see that this turns on pin 5. Then we have a wait loop that counts to 1 million then a write of 0 to the ODR, which will turn off all the outputs, another wait, and we start over again. So this is how our LED blinks. Sweet! To make things a bit more challenging, I've built a simple bare metal Kraken. We have a device and the firmware, and need to get the device to give us the flag that has been programmed into it. We get the output from the device using a serial console, and if we start the device, we can see that it expects us to do something and then press the button. If we just press the button, it tells us to try again. So let's jump into Ghidra. The initial setup is identical to before, though this time before hitting analysis, we will also load the SVD file. We again see some simple startup code in the reset handler and then the call to our main function. Let's rename it to main to make our code a bit more clear. Immediately you can see the strings that we saw on the serial console being passed into a function. So let's blindly assume this is the serial print function and name it accordingly. Next, let's jump into the first function. Now this looks familiar. Just as before, this is the RCC setup code, so let's name it accordingly and jump back to main. In this second function, we see a couple of function calls all taking a GPIO A parameter. When I'm trying to get an overview over a firmware, I will just give things high-level names and then investigate later if required. So let's call this GPIO something and GPIO something too, and call the function GPIO A setup. In the next function, we see a lot of calls with USART being given as an argument. So this probably sets up the serial console. If we convert the parameter passed into the first function to decimal, we can see that it's 115200, which is a very common baud rate. Let's name all of these functions usart something and the function itself usart setup and jump back to main. We can see a reference to GPIO A. So let's start by fixing the pointer type of this to UN32. Next, we see a pointer that was not correctly detected by Ghidra. So let's double click it and hit P to set it to a pointer which will show that this accesses GPIO A PUPDR register. Before we figure out what exactly that all means, let's clean up the rest of the code first by adjusting some types and also fixing up the loop variables. Now that we have a nice and clean decompilation, we can start figuring out what this does. First, the GPIO C mode R register is set to zero, which will set all pins on it to input. Next, the PUPDR register is set to 0xAA, which will enable so-called pulldowns on pin 0, 1, 2, and 3. This basically just gives the pins a defined state of 0 while nothing is connected. I've linked a video describing them in the description. Next, we go into an endless loop, which waits until GPIO C pin 13 is 0. Checking the schematic of the development board, we can see that this is where the button is connected to. So this simply waits for a button press. The next line is the if clause that is interesting to us. If we manage to make this true, we jump out of the endless loop and get the flag. We can see that it reads the input register of GPIOC and then masks the lower four bits. These lower four bits are then compared to binary 1010. So all we have to do is to set pins 1 and 3 to high, aka apply some voltage to it, and we are good to go. To do this, I've set up a breadboard and I check the documentation of the dev board to figure out where GPIOC pins 1 and 3 are. Now all I have to do is to hook this up using some jumper wires and press the button and we have the flag. Now this is obviously a very simple example, though I've used similar methods on a ton of other devices to understand how they work. Being able to quickly determine which peripherals are used where helps you drastically in identifying functions and so on. I hope you liked this video and to see you on this channel again soon. Thank you.